Okay, welcome back to the uh, Weather and Climate Summit. This is uh, day four on Thursday here in Breckenridge. Uh, you just uh, enjoyed a weather briefing from uh, Dale Eck, uh, the uh, uh, director of the Global Forecast Center at the Weather Channel. Um, I do have a couple of announcements of some things that we uh, improved for the uh, website. Uh, now, when you see, uh, go to the main Weather and Climate Summit website, which is www.stormcenter.com slash WXCS2012 for Weather Climate Summit 2012. Um, the pictures that you see moving on the front of the screen, you can click on them now and see them uh, uh, larger. We're trying to update the pictures. <clears throat> excuse me, update the pictures every day so you can get a taste for uh, uh, the speakers and all that sort of stuff going on. And again, uh, just to mention that the actual presentations, the PowerPoint presentations, are available. If you just go to the agenda and then you click on um, any of the links there that say PowerPoint presentations, you'll be able to download each one of those presentations. And after today's um, presentations, they'll be up right away. Uh, as a matter of fact, they may already. Uh, be up. So um, I think that's it. This morning's session is going to be a very interesting one and exciting one on climate science. Our speakers this morning are uh, Tony Genitos, uh, who is director of the uh, Global Change Research Institute at University of Maryland. It's a uh, combined uh, effort between University of Maryland and the Department of Energy. And uh, Eileen Shea from NOAA is uh, going to speak, as well as uh, John Furlow from USAID, the U.S. Agency for uh, International Development. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce uh, Tony uh, Genitos, and we can get started. The way that things are going, going to work this morning uh, is that each speaker will have uh, about 30 minutes to give their presentation, and then we'll have a break. And when we come back from the break, it's a panel discussion because there's so many interesting things that these speakers are going to talk about today. Uh, we'd like our online audience and, of course, the attendees here at the Weather and Climate Summit uh, to really come up with a lot of questions. This is a very um, serious issue of, uh, of climate change. Uh, major changes are happening, uh, not only uh, in North America, but around the world, impacting uh, millions and billions of people. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Tony Genitos. Dave, thanks very much, um, and thanks uh, to you and the, and the other organizers for the opportunity to come and speak. Uh, I'm going to try to do um, really four things uh, in the next half hour. Talk about what we know now about climate impacts, both things that are happening now and, and something about uh, some of the things that we expect to happen. Um, talk a little bit about how this knowledge base has changed over the last decade or two. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the kinds of impacts that are just emerging from the noise and the, that uh, in some cases appear to be somewhat problematic, and I'll finish with what some of the continuing challenges uh, for research are. Uh, the first thing to, uh, to acknowledge is that there are uncertainties in the science. Uh, impact studies um, related to climate change suffer from three big uncertainties. They're hardly ever only the result of changes in the climate system. There are many other factors that are always important. Um, and even if they're driven clearly by climate variability, that's not the same as attributing them clearly to human-caused climate change. Uh, and the last one is that they can take a long time to manifest themselves. Um, and so the importance of having long studies and long time series of data uh, is, uh, can't be overemphasized. But they do all, always tell us something important about risk. They don't always tell us uh, what to do about it, um, and Eileen and John will talk more about that. So, uh, so in, in a sense, when you start talking about climate impacts, is you have a risk management problem in addition to a scientific problem. Um, and so while we acknowledge uncertainties in the science, we want to be sure that we're actually managing those risks and focus on what's really important. Um, so you know, if you have a sign that has sharp edges, uh, and you really don't want to touch them. You might also notice that the bridge is out ahead, and uh, you know, keep your eye on the ball. <clears throat> so having talked a lot about uh, uncertainties, um, I, I want to show you a couple of slides for something that's not uncertain at all, and that's what we're doing to the composition of the atmosphere. Um, these are data from NOAA um, over the last four or five years showing this inexorable rise on the average data of concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If you extended this back 
few thousand years, you'd be back to 280 parts per million, which is about the, the typical atmospheric concentration of CO2 in an interglacial period. Um, we're up around 390 parts per million right now, uh, and we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere, uh, depending on the decade, uh, between one and a half and two parts per million per year. Uh, there's really no uh, serious scientific debate about where this comes from. Um, it's a combination of fossil fuel combustion and uh, releases from land use change, primarily deforestation. And in today's world, for every ton of carbon that we put into the atmosphere from whatever source, the atmosphere doesn't care, about half of it stays in the atmosphere, and the other half is either absorbed in the terrestrial biosphere or absorbed in the oceans. <coughs> So what about climate impacts? There have been three major scientific assessments of impacts over the last decade. Um, the first U.S. national assessment, a very thorough assessment of the impacts on agriculture, water, forestry, um, a whole range of uh, ecological systems from about five years ago, and then a second national assessment. Um, this is largely the literature that I'll draw on, and then there are the thousands of individual papers in the, in the peer-reviewed literature. I promise not to go through each one of those. Um, <clears throat> these are what the, uh, these are just the covers of the three major assessments. Um, I had the good fortune to co-chair um, a couple of these and be a lead author in the third. <clears throat> and over this time period, uh, we've, we've actually looked at a wide variety of impacts, both to ecosystems and natural resources, um, risk to health, uh, water resources, agriculture, um, uh, impacts on infrastructure and sea level rise, and increasingly, and really quite interestingly, um, impacts on uh, energy supply. <coughs> and then and we're starting to understand how these, these different factors inter, uh, interact with each other. Uh, and one of the bottom lines is that there are now widespread climate-related impacts, uh, and we expect them to increase in both uh, magnitude uh, and duration um, over time. But I'm, only, I'm going to pick out four examples, and I'm going to show you a few slides on each one of these examples. I'm going to talk about water resources um, with a little bit of a particular focus for the West, the Mountain West. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about health risks. Uh, I'm going to talk about biology. I was actually trained as an ecologist um, and how climate change has actually changed the biology and ecology of a lot of these systems is really quite an interesting uh, uh, topic, and I, I, I hope you'll find it interesting. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is forest pests. Again, an example that is really quite uh, germane to where we are, uh, where we've been this week. <clears throat> so let me talk first about water. If you look at a, around 60 years of data from, the, uh, from NOAA's NCDC, uh, what you see uh, across the northern tier of the country is that the fraction of precipitation that arrives as snow is declining. <clears throat> And what, ha what happens, particularly in the Mountain West, um, is that uh, we're getting earlier pulses, um, earlier onset of snowmelt, and more of the water, this is the center of mass, more of the water um, comes down earlier in the year. So you're getting, uh, you have a smaller snowpack, um, it melts sooner, so you've got runoff earlier in the year when you really don't need it. You've got less water in natural storage, and then later in the summer when you really would like to have it, uh, you don't have as much of it around. Um, this trend is, uh, is, is, uh, has been very well documented. It's attributable at least in part to long-term warming. Um, there is some role of decadal scale variability, which illustrates this point that even for trends that are the result of changes in the climate system, attributing them to different modes of variability in the climate system is really quite difficult. Um, and in the Mountain West, um, where we've seen this earlier snowmelt peak and reduced summer and fall flow, um, we've, al we've already started to see changes in the management strategies for people who actually have to manage water supply um, in uh, local municipalities. <coughs> let, me, let me go to the second example, and that's to talk a little bit about health. <coughs> and I'm going to talk about two things with respect to health. Um, and one is simply heat stress. <coughs> and so our main finding in these assessments is that risks to health um, are likely to increase. And so this is a little, <coughs> these are the results of a couple of model simulations. Um, these are, actual, these are uh, data from uh, about 1960 to about 1980, so about 20 years of data. 
um, and it's color coded for the number of days that exceed 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and so um, in, 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 in these 20 years, most of those days were concentrated in the southwest, a little bit here in the Central Valley, um, and in Texas up into the, into the plains. But <coughs> uh, when we looked at two different simulations from general circulation models, um, one a low emission scenario, uh, and, w and the second one, a higher emission scenario, by the end of the century, you see very different patterns. And this is, we've looked at a number of different GCMs. This is really not very model dependent. You see much, many more days um, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and in the higher emission scenario, um, you see a, not only a lot of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but much of the country experiencing a large number of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Whoops. Um, <laughs> That'll teach me to walk around. Um, this is not to say, this does not necessarily lead to uh, fatalities, but it does increase the risk, particularly in urban environments, um, for, uh, and increases the challenges um, for adaptation. The second health-related issue that we've looked at, particularly um, in the first national assessment, is simply the relationship between um, factors like uh, maximum daily temperature um, and ozone concentrations. And this is ground level ozone, so this is, um, this is air pollution, um, well known to have an effect on respiratory distress. Um, and it's, it's a, simply a fact of the way this photochemistry works that these are temperature sensitive reactions. Um, and that the warmer it gets, particularly during the spring and summer months when you've got a lot of sunshine, the more rapidly you form oz ozone and the higher the concentrations you'll get during the day. So let me go on to, uh, to biology. <coughs> uh, we saw over the last few days um, a lot of discussion of what happens to, uh, to snow and to, to weather resources, uh, to water resources. Um, what, now, what we now have enough data on from, uh, from satellites is that over the last 20, these are actually old data, so it's now over the last about 25 years, uh, we've actually got an earlier onset of spring, an earlier start to the growing season when things start to green up uh, and start to photosynthesize uh, rapidly. We're now at about, uh, at about two weeks earlier onset of springtime um, in the mid-latitudes. So this is really quite, a, uh, quite an interesting phenomenon um, where we're actually seeing this very large pattern of changes in the way the biosphere actually works. Uh, in, in the, the, way we, the way that these ecosystems uh, photosynthesize and draw carbon down out of the atmosphere. And to no one's great surprise, to no biologist's great surprise, uh, other organisms are also responding to this change. And so this is, this, these are actually data from Camille Parmesan at uh, University of Texas. Um, and she's done an enormous literature review for a large number of species um, not only in North America, but around the world. Um, this is just one example. Tree swallows um, are nesting uh, a week to a week and a half earlier. The date at which they start laying eggs is highly correlated with springtime temperatures. Uh, when uh, you look at other organisms, uh, she's done a lot of study of Edith, Edith's uh, checker spot butterfly. Um, we've actually seen the range of these butterflies um, extend northward and upslope. And which is exactly what you would expect um, from this kind of change in the climate system. And, we've, and there are uh, uh, local <laughs> extinctions, that is local populations that sort of uh, go, ex go extinct um, uh, periodically are predominantly in the southern part of the range. So the, these individual species of insects, of, uh, uh, of migratory birds are starting to react themselves to these cues and variability in the climate system. And we're seeing a wide range of uh, organisms whose ranges are shifting northward uh, or upslope, uh, which climatologically is, is effectively the same. And actually not just for terrestrial species, we're seeing very uh, similar phenomena for, uh, for marine organisms, both for fish, for copepods, um, for a wide, uh, other sorts of plankton, for a wide range of organisms that are also responding to this shift and changes in the climate system. <coughs> this is actually one of my favorite examples because I grew up in the Northeast. This is, actually, this is the current distribution of sugar maple. 
And so this is mapped. Basically, uh, this is work from the U.S. Forest Service from a, a scientist named Lou Iverson. Um, he's done this for a lot of species of trees um, in the eastern deciduous forest. Uh, and so this is, this is the current distribution. And so what, th what they've done is they've taken, uh, in this case, five different general circulation models. And they've run those models with a doubled CO2 atmosphere, so about twice as much CO2 um, as uh, before the Industrial Revolution, and, uh, and then calculated what that change in climate would be, and then asked the question, where is the optimal climate for sugar maple? Well, it turns out that it's somewhere in Quebec. It's not here. And this is... Uh, this is a really interesting example because one of the major factors that determines what kinds of ecosystems we have, whether we have coniferous forests, um, whether we have um, broadleaf forests uh, and deciduous forests, whether we have grasslands, um, is the mean state of the climate system. And we know very little about what happens to these ecosystems when the optimal climate goes somewhere else. The last of my four examples is, is also a forest example, and this is forest pests. And here, I'm going to talk about this little critter. This is a pine bark beetle. Um, this particular species um, is native to lodgepole pine forests of western North America, um, the forests around here, uh, all the way up uh, the Rockies, um, into the Canadian Rockies and uh, into British Columbia. In fact, I'm going to show you a slide from British Columbia in just a minute. And like a l it's a natural part of the disturbance ecology of these forests. And, and the way the biology of this creature works um, is that these things overwinter as larvae underneath the bark. The bark provides them some shelter uh, from, uh, from winter temperatures. And like a lot of forest pests, they go through periodic outbreaks. Uh, what stops an outbreak is killing off enough of the larvae from really cold weather in the winter. Uh, and depending on the species, um, something like a week or two weeks of temperatures that reach about minus 20 Fahrenheit will do the trip. So not unlike the weather we had last night. Uh, and in this occurs in economically important forests, so we actually have quite a lot of historical data on the size and magnitude of outbreaks. And in British Columbia, the previous uh, largest recorded outbreak was around 650,000 hectares during the 30s. Um, today's outbreak is well in excess of a million hectares. And this is what an outbreak looks like. Uh, this should all be green, and so what looks um, what looks kind of pretty, all these red trees, those trees are all dead. Um, and in stands of lodgepole pine, uh, where this outbreak has reached um, really large proportions, the, the mortality rate of, of uh, mature lodgepole pine um, has exceeded, has approached, and in some places exceeded 90%. Not in this case. Not in this case. <coughs> the, um, it's a, it's a, th there is some, some more complication to the story, um, which is why, why are these stands so, um, so uniform in age and species? And that's actually more related to the logging history um, of these forests. And so they're, they're a little more uniform than, uh, than they, they would naturally be. Um, but this is... The, the reason that this kind of mortality is important, there are really sort of three reasons. Um, one is simply economic, particularly in Canada. These are economically important for us. And this outbreak has already had serious economic consequences um, for forest communities. Um, the second is habitat. Uh, there are lots of, of animals, um, birds and other animals that depend on this forest for habitat. Um, and the third is fire. And, and so this is the fire story. These... Um, and these needles turn red when the, when the tree dies and they dry out. And they t it takes a year or two for the needles to actually fall off the trees. So you could think of this as kindling. Fire risk tends to go up about 50% um, when you've got all these dead needles on the trees. Um, and that's when you start really start having this fire problem and where the fire suppression also starts to, to play a role. Um, that you've increased fire risk really quite dramatically um, in these forests. And in parts of Canada, um, the, the provinces are, are, 
are thinking about, well, so what do we do to mitigate the fire risk? Do we do salvage logging? Um, if you salvage log, what can you actually do with the timber? Um, it turns out, interestingly enough, that, that this past in lodgepole pine turns the wood kind of a denim-colored blue, um, which makes it unsuitable for, for pulp, it, and unless you're going to print on blue paper all the time, it makes it um, unsuitable for furniture. It, it's a challenge for, uh, for people to, to think about what to do with it. <coughs> now, so this is a story about the West, but there are many other pest species that are not, not exactly the same species, but whose biology is really quite similar. Um, and in, in places like Alaska, uh, this is a spruce bark beetle, so a different species of tree, different species of insect, but the same sort of biological phenomenon where we're seeing this spread uh, because the winters haven't gotten cold enough for long enough to kill the larvae off. <coughs> I don't know if anybody reads James Thurber anymore, um, but, but I'll, I do want to spend a little bit of time on some things that have been really quite troubling um, as the research goes on. And <coughs> these are some serious research challenges, sort of understanding the speed, the magnitude, and the potential for irreversibility of impacts of climate change. Uh, and a particular concern are those kinds of impacts that, that, that really arise rapidly, that are very large, um, and are really difficult to predict. That is to say, those impacts that appear to be the result of crossing some kind of threshold or tipping point um, in, uh, in ecosystems. Uh, and we have some examples of this now. Um, the one that most people know about um, is this widespread bleaching of corals. This happens, um, this can happen in corals where they actually, they lose the, uh, uh, the symbiotic organisms that, um, that actually do photosynthesize. Uh, they eject them when the corals are stressed or ill, and, and they can get stressed from a, from a, wide, vari from a wide variety of sources pollution, physical damage. But what we've, act, what, what we've seen in uh, subtropical and uh, tropical reefs um, is this happening simultaneously um, around much of the globe. Uh, and it's a direct consequence of rises in, of uh, increases in sea surface temperature. So it's very tightly tied uh, to variability in the climate system. Um, and it's really the only thing that can, that, that can only kind of stress, it can lead to this sort of simultaneous response. And we've had, had some very large episodes of mortality um, in many places around the world. The second uh, one is a sort of inexorable uh, tipping point that we're approaching, um, which is simply stress from sea level rise. And these are data from the U.S. Geological Survey um, for the U.S. And these arrows um, are whether local sea level is either rising, uh, they're color-coded um, and size, uh, to, to note whether local sea level is rising fast or more and more slowly. Um, and what happens in any particular part of the coast is really a consequence of what's happening in the ocean at large, but also what's happening in the dynamics at the coast. There are places where the coast is subsiding. Um, for example, um, in the Gulf region where you've got two effects going on. One is the sea level is actually rising, the mean sea level is rising, but the coast is also subsiding, so the net effect of that is really quite large. But if you look up and down the east coast um, of the U.S., um, there's really no place um, in, uh, from about Cape Cod south that's not seeing additional stress already. And of course the reason that's really important for us is so many people and so much infrastructure is near the coast. And when you have a storm come through, um, as everybody in this room knows very well, um, there's simply more water to push around. Uh, and that's what really ends up doing a lot of damage. The storms don't actually have to be more severe. They can have exactly the same severity, but there's a lot more water uh, to push around, and so you end up with more storm surge. Sorry, can you go back one second? What, yeah. Why on the West Coast did the rises form as extreme, especially in the Pacific? I'm sorry, say again? On the West Coast, your rises aren't particularly... particularly you probably got uplifting there. I, I don't know the answer. Uh, can you repeat that question? Oh, sure. The question was, why, why don't you see uh, as extreme... Uh, changes in, in the West Coast. And then there's, there's this combination of uplift of the crust and, uh, and uh, uh, rise of the ocean. And it, so there's a lot of things going on there. 
And then the last thing that I want to talk about is the revenge of freshman chemistry. All right, so everybody in this room has had this class. Um, there may be people on the web who are taking this class right now. And this is, um, this is simply the chemistry of weak acids and bases. As we get more and more CO2 in the atmosphere, and it starts to come into equilibrium uh, with uh, the CO2 in solution in, in surface waters of the ocean, you get this dis, uh, dissociation and you get this uh, formation of, of uh, bicarbonate and uh, and weak acids in the ocean. And in fact, the oceans have lost about a tenth of a pH unit uh, over the last 40 or 50 years. And they're on track to for that to continue as atmospheric CO2 concentrations to continue to go up. So the oceans are in fact becoming more acidic um, every year. The reason that's important uh, is twofold. And one is that all the organisms in the ocean, corals, sponges, uh, all sorts of plankton that take calcium carbonate out of the water column to create exoskeletons, those re the reactions that govern that are all dependent on pH. And so they actually work less efficiently as that pH drops, as the acidity rises, and it becomes energetically more difficult for those organisms to pull that calcium carbonate out of the water column. We really don't understand what happens in an ocean um, where many of these organisms, which are, which are really the base of, uh, particularly the, the, the planktonic organisms, which are really the base of the food chain, uh, we don't understand what happens in an, in an ocean where those organisms are now under severe stress um, or where, they're, they're, uh, where their communities uh, start to collapse. Nobody imagines, however, that this is good. <laughs> so I want to talk, I want to finish with a couple of points, and these are on continuing research challenges. Um, we have a lot of impacts that are still emerging from the noise. Um, in fact, one of the things that is uh, concerning is that for those of us who've uh, been studying these kinds of impacts for a long time, and I've been doing this since the atmosphere was at, at about 350 parts per million um, instead of 390, uh, we're actually seeing impacts that are happening more rapidly, um, that are uh, larger magnitude, um, and that appear to be uh, larger, in a sense, um, than we had anticipated. And we don't really understand why that is, unless those underlying resources were more sensitive than we had imagined in the first place. Um, <coughs> we will have this continuing challenge that every one of these impacts um, is, is really a function of multiple stresses. Not only changes in the climate system, but changes in demand, uh, changes in how we use the landscape, uh, changes in where we build infrastructure, uh, changes in all sorts of system sensitivities. And this issue of thresholds and tipping points, as important as it is, um, we are a lot better telling where they were once we're past them than we are at predicting them. And that's a major research challenge. And then the last thing is what do we do about adaptation? <coughs> this is a natural question. Um, we're, st we're starting to learn a lot about impacts. Well, what do we do about it? And, and this is, uh, uh, we're going to hear a lot more about this in the next talk, but you, know, you really do have to start to understand which systems, which economic sectors um, are amenable to adaptation choices. What are the costs? How effective can you be? Because you really do have to think ahead. And this is going to require significant thought or preparation or we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So I would just want to leave you with um, this, again, this finding that, that we have a lot of impacts now. They're clear, clearly related to changes and variability in the climate system. Some of them are, in fact, attributable to anthropogenic change with a very high probability. Um, and in almost all cases, we expect these uh, impacts to increase in both rate and magnitude um, over the coming decades. Thank you for your attention. Um, these are uh, websites for more information, both the Pacific uh, Nas uh, Northwest National Lab website, our own institute's website, um, and if you've got any questions for me, uh, please feel free uh, to send me an email. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tom.